Welcome to Monday Night Live, coming to you as usual from the public media network where every voice matters. We're coming to you on 96 tonight, repeats on Thursday, Friday and Saturday, we'll be on 97 and again on Sunday at 97. Uh, I hope all the people who've been watching us on 19 have discovered the new channel number and I'm not talking to uh, an empty house as it were, I don't think that's the case because we have a good discussion ahead and I think uh, you're going to find it stimulating. I think you're going to be hearing about someone who's actually making things happen, shaping our community, doing something that some people would say is not possible but hey we're going to do it. Uh, businesses we keep hearing are saying well give us a tax break, if we have a tax break we can maybe hire more people. Big businesses are saying, well, we can't really compete with those Germans. Give us uh, a tariff barrier to protect us. And uh, I can remember many years ago, a man in business in the British Isles, because this is not a new phenomenon, business people saying, well, you know, it's, it's tough. This man said, what businesses need is not smoother seas, it's stronger swimmers. And I think the same thing applies to communities. What we need is not a smooth ride. We need strong swimmers, strong organizations. Uh, last week on this program, we talked to Tom Dietz from the Kalamazoo Museum. We looked at the history of our area. Tom really knows his Michigan history, and particularly Kalamazoo history. And towards the end of the program, he said, you know, the great thing about Kalamazoo is that it's continually reinvented itself. We started way back with Bronson and we were into farming. And then we found bog iron and we were into founding. And then we thought if we can make sheets of metal, then we can make Kalamazoo stoves and plowshares. And then of course the paper industry came along. And, and that's moved on, but then pharmaceuticals and Stryker moved into town. We've constantly reinvented ourselves. And we're going to be talking to a man tonight who is helping to reinvent part of Kalamazoo, because I'm sure that's what's happening. So if we can have a broad shot, please, Bill. I can introduce our guest for the evening and make sure I get it right, Dr. Hal Jensen. That's right. MD, MBA, people will see it on the screen, founding dean the School of Medicine, Western Michigan University. Now it's out of the bag. All this about breaking new ground and reinventing and uh, getting on with it and doing it. Um, I've heard you talk. You know what you're talking about. You're quite determined to make a success of this new medical school venture. But before we get down to bricks and mortar and just what it's all about, we always put our guest on the spot and say, tell us about your background a little, how you got to this position in Kalamazoo in uh, not half an hour. Well, thank you very much. I really appreciate the opportunity to talk to you about the medical school and to share a little bit about myself. I'm a pediatrician. I was uh, trained, went through medical school and trained as a pediatrician. And what I really found that was most exciting to me was when I was able to help patients get better. So I ended up in pediatric infectious diseases, but I was also intrigued by the revolution that was occurring in molecular biology. I remember when I went through college and people showed me that you could actually sequence DNA. It was so amazing to me when, when that was really in the 70s, that was really the mm -hmm. leading edge of research. And I was able through my career to actually study it in Cambridge at the place where sequencing was actually developed and refined. So to be able to marry my clinical interest in pediatric infectious diseases with my research interests in molecular virology, I feel like I've had just a wonderful career. And I think it's those experiences across the breadth of clinical medicine, molecular biology research, clinical research, and my, my roles as department chair and chief academic officer at a regional a campus of a medical school before I came here that's really prepared me for this exciting opportunity here in Kalamazoo. So yes, you filled in a lot of big Actually, one thing I was going to mention on the way through, 
And now you've, you've brought it up right at the beginning. It, it is exciting, biomedicine. Um, you probably know Professor Targowski. Andrew Targowski is in the business school up at Western. If you don't know him yet, go and knock on his door over there in uh, Snyder. Um, he is bubbling with the idea of a biomedicine group, you know, cl a cluster, mm -hmm. and he thinks we've got the makings of it. I know there's the uh, innovation center uh, up there on the hill in the business park. And I know there are people in that place working on how you can make the body recognize cancer cells in the prostate as foreign. As I understand it, the immune system should finish off these things, but somehow cancer comes in under the, the screen and they're going to make it possible. At the same time about that it's, it is so exciting about how much we know, we also recognize how much, how much we, we don't know. know. Yes. Yes. And I think this is really an exciting time to be in medicine. If you think back about a, a physician who graduated from medical school, say, in 1970, and now 30 years, 40 years later, they're, they're approaching the end of their career, think back about all the things that have changed in medicine during their career, all the new drugs, all the new therapies, all the new types of therapies, radiation therapy and the new scans, you know, not just x-rays anymore, but CT scans and PET scans and MRIs things that were just not heard of no. when that person graduated from medical school. No. No. And the revolution in molecular biology, that got me excited about medicine and about applying some of the basic principles of biology to help, to help advance knowledge and uh, lead to new discoveries. There's just a tremendous amount of opportunity there and it's only getting larger. And so think about a, a physician today who's graduating from medical school. Can one even imagine what, what their career, what the, the things that they will see during their career, what kind of medicine they'll be practicing at the yes, end of their yes, career. Yes, yes. And it is just amazing. It's very challenging, too, because it means that we can't train physicians just to memorize facts. We can't train physicians to practice medicine perfectly when they graduate and think that they're done. No. We have to train physicians to be lifelong learners, and those are the kinds of physicians we need for the future. And that's really, I think, part of the excitement also about being in medical education now, is how do we prepare our physicians of tomorrow to meet the challenges of tomorrow? So I think this is an exciting time in biology, it's an exciting time in medicine, and it's an exciting time for medical education. I'm glad you started that way. <laughs> well, I'm not surprised that you did, because you're an enthusiast. Um, you're going to need medical students. As, uh, we'll, we'll get to that at the end, but I mean, you, you're building, you're developing everything at the university for this medical school, but it's going to, I'm going to say, stand or, or fail on whether you can attract medical students. I mean, you've already said, look, people out there who've got boys, girls, thinking of college, this is a career that isn't ever going to disappear. It's going to get more exciting as it goes along. If a, if a young person wants a career where they can make a difference, where they can really make a difference in people's lives, um, I think this is just an incredible opportunity. Think about how special that relationship is between a, fa a patient and the, and the physician and, and, the, and the family and the physician. You share your innermost problems, secrets, issues with, with that physician. It's really a sacred trust. There's no more, I think, meaningful way for someone to interact with other human beings and through the practice of medicine. So it, is a, it really is a special opportunity. If you're looking for an academic challenge, every patient that comes in is a new problem, and usually many problems. And really, it's, it's trying to solve those problems for, to help the patient. So it's an exciting field because it's challenging. It's changing. And so the, the information changes, and there's a demand to, to keep up with, with the information that's out there. Uh, so I find it incredibly challenging, incredibly fulfilling, and incredibly re rewarding. And I think for a young person who's, who wants to enter a career where they won't have to worry about job security, where they can really make a difference, I think medicine is obviously an outstanding choice. You heard it here, folks. Um, who somebody said it? There's an Up John movie 
about the Upjohn Company, and it started off with rather pretentious, an organization is the lengthening shadow of one man. I'm not trying to flatter you, but <laughs> you are going to put your stamp on this. And uh, don't be bashful. You know the kind of people you want to enroll, staff and students. You have a pretty clear picture of what you want those students to learn as they go through. And before we talk about the feasibility, uh, the cost of building and, and, and certification, uh, whatever it's called, accreditation. accreditation, all those things, do you mind if we start with what it is you want to get across to these young people? Now, I presume one of these days you'll have people coming back for retraining, older people, but right now you're going for medical school start off. So think about it this way. We're training the physicians for tomorrow who are going to be taking care of us as we get older. They're going to be taking care of our kids and our grandkids. And so we have a vested interest in having the very best medical students that we can have having the best residencies in our residency training programs, having the best faculty of the medical school. We're trying to, incre to, to strengthen the quality of, of medical care in Kalamazoo, and I think we can do that with a medical school. And it, because all of us as physicians have to be lifelong learners, that's one of the roles of a medical school. So even for the physicians who are in the community now, they've been through medical school, they've been through residency, we're all lifelong learners. And a medical school can help with that because none of us know all the answers. And none of us know all the answers when we graduate. But we have to be able to find the information that we need at the right time for the right, for when that patient comes through the door. So we have to be able to access all that information that keeps getting larger and larger. Here's a question I hadn't thought of in advance. You're an enthusiast. My guess is you've talked to a lot of the practitioners in our community already. I have. How enthusiastic are they? I mean, there's a lot of enthusiasm in this community, in Calhoun County, in Southwest Michigan for the medical school. There are a lot of physicians here who are really eagerly looking forward to participating with the medical school to help training the next generation of physicians. I think many, many of us, most of us, see that we all owe a service to our profession, that we've all learned because of the contributions of those who went before us. And if we want the best physicians in Kalamazoo, in Southwest Michigan tomorrow, we're the best people to make sure that we get the best physicians. So there are a lot of physicians who see this as this is the opportunity to contribute back to the community to help improve the quality of health care for tomorrow in the community by training the physicians for tomorrow. You're going to do some great things. Curriculum. Curriculum themes, ethics and professionalism, you put at the top of this. Are they in any particular order? When, uh, when I first uh, considered this position, um, I uh, looked at, at, the, at the needs of medicine as if it was a blank tablet. And I've been through this process a couple of times before. We went through this in San Antonio in the mid-90s of redesigning the curriculum. We went through it when I was at Tufts about five years ago now, redesigning the curriculum. There are some great medical schools already in Michigan, University of Michigan and Michigan State, uh, Wayne State as well, but University of Michigan and Michigan State, they also are going to be redesigning their curriculum in the next three, three, two or three years. This was an opportunity with a new medical school to take a fresh look at the curriculum and really to develop a curriculum to meet the needs for tomorrow. And I developed what I called themes, and these are themes that we've embedded in our curriculum throughout the four years of medical school curriculum. So as you noted, ethics and professionalism was number one on my list. Hmm. And it, it may seem odd that we actually have to talk about ethics and professionalism, because many of us have, have assumed that that's just part of medicine, and it should be. But we live in an era where we cannot we can't any longer just take it for granted that people are going to have the ethics that we expect of them, that they're going to have the professionalism that we require of them. Yeah, yeah. And so part of our task is to recruit the students 
who are going to display the highest levels of personal and professional ethics and who are going to embody those principles of professionalism that we need to have in the future. Uh, I put it, number one, because there's a lot of things that I could train somebody to do. I can give them all kinds of skills and knowledge. It's very hard, I think, to embed ethics and professionalism into somebody. I think we can certainly help and we can increase uh, the, the level of professionalism, but there has to be that innate level of, of professionalism in the individual. So we're recruiting for those kinds of students. And we put that in our curriculum to make sure that we foster that during our curriculum, that, that people who, who are you know, good come out to be great <laughs> and, uh, and who are great when they enter yes. are even, even better. So there's, that's why I put it number one among the 12 different themes and, that I have. And I thought there are new challenges coming along. Uh, there was a time when no physician or committee had to decide who got a new kidney. And, and there are some very complex ethical issues. Some big and, things now that really do the, the patients or would-be patients or would-be recipients have to accept the fact that this has been studied very carefully. And yes, there is a rationing when it comes to kidneys and livers that are in short supply. But the public has to accept that it's fair and it's been thought through very, very carefully. Medicine is very complex. Yes. It will become even more complex. And it raises sometimes new questions and new issues that we haven't, we haven't no. had to address before. And that's where we have, to, we have to train students so they have the skills when they're in situations that they can apply those principles to those situations that we can't imagine. Yes, yes. So you start right there. Humanism and cultural competence. Can we break that down to words of one syllable? Well, one of the things that we want to make sure that we have in our curriculum is to remember, that, that, to remember the patient and the family. Uh, one of my pet peeves is not to refer to patients by their disease. It's a patient who has a disease, not a disease. Yeah. And so re remember sometimes in, in, that we're taking care of patients. And as I talked about before, it's, it's a sacred trust that we have with our patients. And we can't lose sight of that. No. And we, we want to foster the humanism in our students so that, that we don't, we, we, we want to train competent physicians, but we want to train compassionate competent physicians. And we want to make sure that we have that when we, when we get through our medical school training. Now, in the, when I went through medical school, many of these themes that I have, we didn't actually pay much attention to them because it was assumed that, of course, you're, you, have these, hmm. you have these behaviors and you, you have these attitudes because that's why you went to medical school. <laughs> but we now see with some problems that come up that we're not, we can't just assume that any longer. And so that's why these things end up in the curriculum, and so we pay attention to them. And if the physicians and surgeons in a hospital or in an area have this going for them, it'll rub off on most of the other health professionals. Absolutely. I mean, I heard uh, an ambulance, uh, not the driver, but his EMT. assistant, you know, arriving and, oh, got a fracture for you. <laughs> oh, we've got a fatal. That kind of terminology rings around, and you're we, saying that's wrong. We have to be careful that we don't become desensitized. Yes. And, and, and that recognize yes. how important our relationship is with the patient. So it's more than just these young doctors are going to get this across to other young people in the hospitals that in which they work. If it's right up there, it's a high reasoning based on evidence-based medicine. I don't plan to take you through all these because we could spend at least half an hour on every one of them. We could. Um, well, what do you think are the big ones? Choose, choose any one you want to. to Some of the things it. that are very different about medicine now that have changed a great deal, uh, we, we have this perception of a physician being kind of Marcus Welby and going out or practicing in, in a solo practice and they're kind of on their own and by themselves. Medicine's not practiced that way anymore. Medicine is very much a team sport. Even if you're in, in just a small group of physicians, typically physicians are not in solo practice anymore. And even, even there, it's not just physicians. 
it's physicians and nurses and, and allied healthcare providers, respiratory therapists, medical technicians, radi radi uh, x-ray technologists. There's a number of people that help take care of the patient. So it's not just physicians. It's across the continuum of healthcare professions. And we have to train our physicians so that they learn in, in an interdisciplinary setting because that's how they're going to practice medicine. So that's a change from 10 or 15 years ago when we trained nurses here and physicians here and pharmacists here, and then when they get out in the real world, they have to work together, and they haven't, they haven't learned that yet. And we, we hope to make a dent in that, and so we train together so that they can practice together. Another uh, big change has been the use of simulation training. And, uh, you know, the, the dictum in medicine used to be see one, do one, teach one. And now it's see one, simulate many, do one, teach one. So we, we've put simulation into our curriculum in a very uh, strong way. And, and, and while all medical schools are doing something in simulation, we've really put it on steroids. We are going to have a terrific simulation center because we're really centering our curriculum around the simulation opportunities. But it's a great opportunity to learn things like teamwork because you'll put a team of, of students and, and, and others taking care of a patient, and you can actually practice the teamwork. It's a great opportunity to learn about things that you hope you only see maybe once or twice in your lifetime. It's really hard to practice anaphylaxis because we don't expect to see it very often. Well, here I can practice it 10 times a day. Yes. So simulation-based training is, is a huge part of our curriculum, and those are some of the big, bigger changes in, in, the, in the way medicine is being taught. Could I make it concrete from a personal point of view? I remember in hospital on one occasion, um, they needed to take some arterial blood to look for oxygen levels. Yes. Now, getting a needle into a vein isn't always easy, but this young fellow came in. Clearly, he hadn't done it very often, and his supervisor was with him, and he said, uh, this is a student. <laughs> uh, would you mind if he... And I said, fine, we've all got to learn. And he tried, and the needle went round and about. And eventually I looked at the, the guy who knew how to do it, and he, he took over. Now I hear, talk to KCMS. I mean, students can go in, <laughs> and there's, there are things that feel like veins, feel like arteries, and they yes. can practice getting needles into these things. And we do. And we practice using... It's not just by feel anymore or by look. We actually use ultrasonography. So we practice inserting catheters in that with ultrasonography. So the technology has really helped with that. Yes. But you are right. We all have to learn at some point. What this does is allow us to learn on the simulated patient yes. before you actually go do one on a real patient. I think the people who remember right, thinking of it, you can take the emergency care people, the people who come out in the back of an ambulance to catch you when you had a heart attack. The emergency medical technicians. Emergency medical technicians. And <laughs> they, they come in from a kind of ambulance, mock ambulance, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. into a room, and there's this dummy on the, on the table. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and they've got to make decisions and find out what the problem is. And if they do the wrong thing, the dummy will grunt. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, uh, so these people are being trained on dummies for real-time stuff. You arrive, you don't quite know what you're going to find when you get into the house. The, the amount of, the, the opportunities for simulation training are really quite amazing, and they're, and they're getting better all the time. And it's already here in Kalamazoo. And, and we, with our simulation center, we're going to be able to do some very sophisticated training for our medical students, for our residents, and even for the physicians who are in the community. I think this is a great opportunity for all of us as lifelong learners to come back and, and learn new things yes. and improve yes. the skills that we do have. <sighs> Competency-based assessment. Sounds like examination. Well, it, it, in a way it is. What, uh, what we've done in the past in medical education is say, well, you've spent four years in medical school, then obviously it's time to graduate. And it's been time-based. And what we've learned is that people learn at different rates. And so just because you've spent four years in medical school doesn't mean that maybe you're ready to graduate. So we are basing our curriculum on competencies. And we have competencies for each of the courses, 
We have competencies for each of the years and competencies to be able to graduate. So by the time somebody graduates, we know that they have to be competent in these different areas or they won't be able to graduate. So it isn't that you go to f medical school for four years and graduate. You go to medical school for four years and if you've achieved the competencies that you need to have, you graduate. And then we expect that as those students go into residency, that they become uh, not just competent, but proficient or, or even better. And as they continue in their career, they become experts and masters. And then, as, they, as people are in the community now, they can come back and help train the next generation of physicians in the medical school. Back in the 50s, there was a young fellow who came out of medical school and wrote a book. He never went into medicine. He made his name, the doctor in the house was the, the yes. name of the book, became a movie. Yeah. Then he wrote Doctor at Sea, <laughs> Doctor in Love. All these doctor movers, doctor in the house, I'll never forget. The book, I mean, these medical students had a ball. They did everything that, you know, we thought medical students did. They knew how to party. Uh, they knew how to do all these things. And they all seemed to graduate. When they made the movie, the only ones who graduated, the ones who'd been actually seen reading a book yeah. at some point in the movie, they didn't want to scare the general public. You've gone way beyond this now. You're saying we can assure people that uh, they won't just have a degree, but there will be competencies Absolutely. locked in because they've done it our way, or and, we've done it. And that's one of the big changes in the curriculum in medical education, and we're embedding that in our curriculum to begin with. One more. Um, interprofessional education. As I talked about the need for us to learn uh, in a setting that's going to emulate where we're going to practice. And we need to train our students in, a, in an interdisciplinary setting because that's how they're going to practice medicine. So we're working with the, uh, the nursing school, the PA school, the other allied health programs at Western Michigan University, and I think eventually other allied health programs in the region so that we can train medical students and their students together. So I hope to be able to use our simulation center that we'll be able to train our students together and that we'll have them train in, in clinical settings together yes, yes. so that we can, they can learn from each other and learn how to work well with each other. Years ago in Bronson on the oncology floor, um, I came across a room called the Scream Room. Don't know if it's still there. I don't know. The corridor went down and then there was a little side corridor. Just around the corner was this little room, the Scream Room. And I said to one of the nurses, what's that for? She said, it's for screaming. People on this floor you know, are very seriously ill, and the relatives are waiting for them to die. And there are times when they just want to go over there, and if they want to cry, they can cry. And she said, we nurses need to go in there sometimes and scream. She had no idea how traumatic it is. And then someone else said, you know, I'm not criticizing physicians. My experience has been that the physician, one of the very important things is that he makes the right decision. He doesn't get it wrong. Because if he gets it wrong, he doesn't look good in the eyes of his colleagues. And I've seen a physician say to a patient, I'm sorry, I've got some very bad news for you. You have got... And out he goes. And he's okay because he knows he's made the, he got the right diagnosis and he's been truthful. You know. The nurse comes in and says to the patient, do you want to cry? Do you want to hold my hand? And when nurses and doctors work together, mm -hmm. it is something special. It's, it, either one of them is incomplete without the other. Exactly. And, and we have to practice medicine in the future together. Yes. Your story, though, raises uh, another competency here, communication and interpersonal skills. How to, deliver, how to deliver bad news in yes. a compassionate way. Yes. And that's also a, a, a big change. We used, to cha we used to take that for granted, that, that students would learn by seeing and, and that w there were really, uh, that they'd learn by watching others do it. Well, we know that, that some physicians in the community are terrific at delivering bad news, and some are not so terrific. And we need to train our students so that they can be terrific. Yes. Yeah. Tough things ahead. Patient care, medical knowledge, interpersonal communication skills, practice-based learning. You have got a lot of, a lot of discussion has gone on up there. It isn't just you saying 
this is what we're going to do. You've got a team of people who are thinking things through, I believe. We have some great strengths here in Kalamazoo. One is uh, the willingness of people to support the medical school and to jump in to become involved in the medical school. There are about 270 people across Kalamazoo, mostly physicians, many non-physicians, who have been involved in helping develop the medical school so far. We have about 220 people who are working just on the curriculum, what, what we need to train our medical students to be. So as we've, um, as we've developed this, uh, we have a tremendous opportunity for people in the community who want to be involved in medical school uh, to, have, to become involved. And so we have physicians at Bronson, physicians at Borges, physicians at KCMS, which is going to merge into the medical school on July 1st and become part of the medical school, and many uh, physicians in the community and others in the community, faculty at Western Michigan University. All of those individuals have helped contribute to develop the medical school so far. Um. Required student experiences. People, well, not just people watching, but the guy sitting here. They've done a lot before they get to medical school, haven't they? They have. They it's, don't come out of high school and go to medical school. Correct. It's, it's four years of undergraduate before you can get into medical school. So, and, and it's very competitive. Uh, two years ago, there were about 42,000 students in the United States who wanted to go to medical school. There were 18,000 who were admitted. So th that means there's 14,000 who were not able to go into medical school. So there's a lot of students out there who want to go to medical school who we just don't have room for them. And that's part of what the need is. We have a physician shortage. It's going to get worse across the U.S. And uh, that's part of the need to develop new medical schools like the medical school here. It's part of the reason why other medical schools, the existing medical schools, have increased their medical school uh, size by 20 to 25 percent. Well, I think we should repeat this because I'm sure there are people saying, maybe some of the people watching are people to whom they're going to speak in the coming weeks. Another medical school, you know, aren't there? you've just put your finger right on it, I think. There are well, a lot of people out there who would like to go into medicine, are qualified to go into medicine, have got the right motivation but can't get a place in a medical school. At, at the same time that we are um, not, we don't have room in the United States for our students to go into medicine, we are recruiting about six to seven to 8,000 international medical graduates every year into the United States. So at the same time that we're telling our own students, we don't have room for you, we're importing sometimes the best and the brightest from across the world. And I'll leave it as a rhetorical question. Should the United States be, be a brain drain on the rest of the world? Now, I'm absolutely in favor of students, graduates coming here to learn medicine. And many of them want to go back to practice medicine in their home countries. And I think that's great. But m many of them want to stay here. And, and we are denying our own, our own children the opportunity to get into medicine at the same time that we are draining the rest of the world of, of physicians who are coming here. Yeah, I don't know whether it's happening here. I know in Britain, where I had a fair amount of hospital experience, um, we were not bringing people and training them. We were getting people who had qualified in India yes. and Pakistan yes. and bringing them to Britain into the National Health Service. So we weren't just taking out their brightest potential doctors. We were taking the people they'd already right. paid for and trained, right. robbing the poor to Help the rich, I suppose, is one way of putting it. Yes. So that's just one reason why a medical school makes sense for Kalamazoo. Yes. I think another important factor is that if we want to assure the pipeline of physicians for this region, we know that the two most important factors about why a physician practices in a given geographic area is it's an area where they came from, where they have ties, or it's where they trained. And if we want we, this country is, is going to have a shortage of physicians in the future that's going to continue to get worse. We see some of that already with the difficulties that, that Bronson and Borges have in recruiting physicians now. It's very competitive because they're competing with the rest of the country. We know that Michigan is going to have a shortage of 4,000 primary care physicians in the year 2000. There's also going to be a shortage of 4,000 specialty care physicians in, 2000, in, in, I'm sorry, in 2020. 
So in 2020, there'll be a shortage of 4,000 primary care and 4,000 specialty care physicians. We're going to be competing with the rest of the country. And we know that if we want to have the pipeline of physicians for this region, we need to train physicians in this region. And we need to take students from this region into medical school. And those are two, two more reasons why a medical school makes sense for Kalamazoo. As you're really saying that people who are getting their medical qualification here, and you mentioned residents earlier. Yes. A resident is someone who has got his MD. So after, MD. after four years of medical school, you graduate with your MD degree, but you can't practice medicine yet. No. You have to do a residency, and that could be anywhere from three to five, maybe more years if you do a fellowship, but it's three to five more years of training. And uh, we, we have about 200 residents right now at KCMS, and that will become part of the medical school mm -hmm. on July 1st. And we want to make sure that we have that pipeline of residents for this community because about a third of those residents end up practicing in this region. So if we want to have the best physicians in this community for tomorrow, we need to have the best training programs in this community. Yes. Because that's where yes, we're getting yes, a lot yes. of, our, of our physicians. Talk to um, a newly, uh, in, here you say, boarded. In, in Britain, we talked about now you're a consultant, mm -hmm. you're actually a registrar or a senior registrar. You're on your way to becoming a uh -huh. specialist at some length. And he said, you know, most of the fellows with whom I went through university from, you know, the, the bachelor's degree, within a year of leaving university were in decently paid jobs, earning money. I had another long program to go to. By the time I was earning money, I had a wife and two children to support. And he said, somehow the vocation survived. But it gets to the point where you've got to earn money because you've taken on fairly good debts in many cases, and you've got a wife and children. And you know, the kids who came through college with me have been, now they're on Wall Street or somewhere. And it really hit home. It is a long, hard drive. It is. And you've got to find people who are in it for the long run when you, you, you actually bring them into your school. Well, um, the, the reason that we call residents residents is because they used to reside and be resident in the hospital. And, uh, so they could work know, 24 so, hours a day. So you'd work full-time in the hospital because that's where you live. Well, we now allow people to go through medical training and actually have a life. And we are seeing more and more residents and, and more and more medical students who do have those family obligations outside of medicine. So it is, it is becoming, I think it's becoming more humane. It's becoming more possible to have a, a blended life be between medicine and a personal life, you're able to do things that, that I think in 20, 30, 40 years ago that was much more difficult. And that's part of the reason why I think we see uh, many more women. It's much more reasonable now. You don't have to sacrifice the rest of your life to be able to go through medical school. Could we slip back to that undergraduate education for a moment? Sure. Talk to Nick Andriadis, who was there a few months ago. A physician, uh, yes. A physician, yes. Uh, in the Lee Honors College. And the Dean of, of the Honors Dean College. Dean of the Honors Western. College College. And uh, Dr. Dieter Henneke, years mm -hmm. ago, who talked about the Lee Honors College, he said the most exciting classes he took, he retired from being president and was going to teach in the Lee Hon Honors College. Mm -hmm. And he gave this class 12 books to read. And within half an hour, one of the students was knocking on his door saying, Dr. Henneke, about the books, Oh, here we go, too many books. And the young fellow said, uh, I've read six of those books already. Could you recommend another six books? Yeah. And what I got from the Leonis College was the fact that they're doing some very special things there. And my guess is that that's the place you'd like to see some of your would-be medical students spending some time in that kind of academic Absolutely. And, and I think that if you were to ask President Dunn, what's the advantage of having a medical school for Western Michigan University? Part of the reason of having that medical school is because it will attract more very high caliber students to Western Michigan University. 
And so I, I think that what will happen is that you'll see a greater number of students come to the biological sciences and come into other areas, not necessarily always just medicine, <laughs> but because we will be able to help uh, increase the visibility and the recognition of Western Michigan University. And also, can, I hope that just as their faculty may, may help teach in the medical school, that we can help with providing greater opportunities to the students at Western that they wouldn't otherwise have. So a student who wants to be involved in a clinical setting, we now have that opportunity for that kind of, of experience. So you're going to get smart people, men and women, boys and girls, I don't know what age, we're talking about 18 year olds, from across the country coming here, four years undergraduate study, yes. whether it's in the Lee Honors College or somewhere else in Western, and going on to the medical school to get their MD. Four years. And then residency opportunities. Three to five years. Three to five years. And very likely by that time they've got a family and they're in this area and they could be supplying the physicians we desperately need here. That's right. We, we want them, we want the really, we want to attract really great students and we want those really great students to have some roots in Kalamazoo. You see why I started by saying this is, an, this is a community that has reinvented itself. And, and we don't want smoother seas, we stronger swimmers. We, we know that there's about, at least data from three or four years ago, that there's over a $500 billion economic impact of the 130 or so medical schools in the U.S. And in Michigan, that's over $24 billion a year. $24 billion a year from and, current medical schools. And most of that is concentrated in Detroit and Lansing. And it really has not filtered out to other parts of the state. There are just opportunities that the faculty at Western won't be competitive for without colleagues in the School of Medicine to be, to be uh, colleagues in, in research projects. That uh, it will attract the kind, it'll attract more of the kinds of companies that have already been so uh, well known in Kalamazoo. Uh, you know, it's in a, kind of an anomaly that Upjohn and Stryker started here. It, it's much more likely in the future that those kinds of companies will start in the setting of, of a medical school. And so, the, you know, it's, it's, those are two uh, companies that really started with the genius of individuals. The entering shadow of one man, and, and W.E. We, and Homer Stryker. Yes. And, and, and we need to uh, recognize that medicine is very complicated right now, and research is very complicated, and it's no longer just one person who can make the advances in research. It's teams of people, and we have to have the right environment for those teams to be successful. Well, cluster. I, yes. uh, back to Andrew Targowski. You know, we need clusters, uh, biomedicine, clusters of medical clusters. Uh, think of Grand Rapids, mm -hmm. the furniture industry, mm -hmm. a number of furniture manufacturers in Grand Rapids. And then you find, well, there are people who supply things to the furniture industry. Yes. It might be brass screws, it could be good mahogany or teak. Or... So now we've got a cluster of producers of furniture and another cluster of the people who supply furniture people, all in the same area, short supply lines, know their customers. It, it happens. Yeah. And what you're saying is we're, we're going to have a cluster here. And the multiplier effect of, of being able to build on the strengths of Kalamazoo, the companies that are here, the legacy that's here, yes. that spirit of entrepreneurship that's so deep in Kalamazoo already, the medical school can help foster that, I think really be transforming in being able to move the economy in a very positive way by opening up opportunities that wouldn't be here without a medical school. 44 minutes, time is flying. It's a private school, kind of a private school. A hundred million dollars, I think, some generous person contributed just to get it going. Where are we with bricks and mortars? I, I know the, the building on, on Lovell, and on Portage Street. Portage Street. Um, that's where the medical school is going to be. M uh, yeah, M MPI has donated yes. the former Pfizer building, known as uh, Building 267. Which was the former Upjohn building. Yes. 
And people will be saying, well, it must be a medical building already. It was built by a pharmaceutical company. Well, it must is. Must have laboratories. It's a, research, it's a research building. Okay. And one of the advantages is it has some research space in it that we can reactivate. Mm -hmm. And it will also give us the opportunity to grow into it over the next 15, 20 years. So it's, a, it's more of a building than we need right now. But it's a, it's, it's, a, it's a great gift to the medical school because it, it allows us to jumpstart the programs that we want to have and allows us to have the opportunity to grow into, into future space down the road. So it, it does have research space in it, but it wasn't built as a medical education building. No. And so there will have to be extensive renovation and a small addition to actually accommodate the lecture halls and the, and the space that we need for education. So we are in the process of developing the design. We're actually quite far along in the design phase of that. And I hope that by late this summer, early fall, that we're able to show some renderings of what, what the renovation will look like. You have, maybe, would you come back in the program sometime? And oh, maybe absolutely. we can show some diagrams. Absolutely. I, I, um, things like dissections, I'm sure somebody's saying, are they going to have dissections? down there, bodies and people will go in and, I mean, the, all the basics of a medical school are going to be there. Yes. Plus a whole bunch of concepts and ideas that you're spear pointing here, you're, you're pushing through. So uh, anatomy is still a very important part of medical school. It's taught a little bit differently than it was 15, 20 years ago. Uh, we don't have all the medical students spend all the time, which used to be a, a lot of time, mm. dissecting cadavers. Now we use a lot of um, specimens that are what are called plastinated. So they're, they're human specimens. Mm -hmm. They look and feel just like real, they are real tissue, and they look and feel uh, fresh, but they're plastinated so they last much longer so that you don't have to dissect as many cadavers. I did so, some back in '53 at the Royal College of Surgeons, uh, physical therapy. I didn't do a lot, maybe about uh, two months, and this place smelt of formalin. It was mm -hmm. a pretty grim place. We've moved on from that. This is a little better than that. See, I learned that. Every Monday evening I learn yes. a great deal. Um, when are uh, you going to have the first medical students coming in? We. Uh, are moving towards accreditation and because we are a private medical school uh, we have actually three steps of accreditation three different processes that we have to go through one of those is the state accreditation and we've already received the authority from the state to to be a, a degree granting institution that grants the MD degree and there are two others one is the called the liaison committee on medical education and they approve the MD program, and then there's the Higher Learning Commission that approves the institution because we're a brand new private standalone entity. So those are both in process, and our schedule with those accreditation steps is that we would be accredited uh, in the next six months or so to start taking medical students, which means we can start recruiting in early 2013, which means our first class would be in 2014. So you have to recruit more than a year in advance. So we, we will take our first class of about 50 students in 2014. We'll grow a little bit every year to a target size of about 80 students per class. But I'm back to um, the four years undergrad. Maybe already that you're getting people who see there's going to be a medical school there. I don't know. Maybe you can't recognize them. You don't ask them when they come in, are you thinking you're going to medical school here? But we're perhaps already attracting some students well, we're not to Kalamazoo we're, who one day will become yeah. your medical students. We're, we're, we're not accepting applications. We're, 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 not, uh, we're not doing anything uh, related to enrollment. But I do know that there are students who are out there who are at Western today who are looking forward to applying to our class in 2013 to be in the 2014 class. So there are students already at Western who I think are eagerly anticipating a medical school at Western. And who, have you talked to the high schools? Have you been on Michael Rice? I mean, we, the, the Kalamazoo Promise. I mean, we need to get at some of these young we, kids. We have, we've, I've talked to a couple of the high schools and we will have programs Part of what we want to do as a medical school is reach out into the community. 
people have asked me, won't it be great when that first student from Kalamazoo graduates from the medical school? And absolutely, it will be. But I would ask the question, wouldn't it be great if the medical school could actually increase the high school graduation rate in Kalamazoo? So we would like to reach out from the medical school and actually make a difference in the community. Now, I think some of the kids that we can reach will be interested and will maybe want to go into medicine. Some of them will want to go into other healthcare professions. But I would really like to see us work to help all those students see what the great opportunities that are that are out there beyond high school and so that they have that desire to continue to excel and to get through high school. And I think if we can help with that, that's, I think, part of our mission of a medical school as well. Yes, yes. I started by saying we were going to enthuse people. We were, we were going to be optimistic about the future of Kalamazoo. And I think that's part of it. There must be kids in high school now who are reading the news and saying, but there aren't any jobs out there. What are the careers? What have you? What's, what's the point of this? And you're saying, we're thinking long term here. Say it again. We are short of physicians. We have a shortage of about 4,000 primary care physicians and a shortage of about 4,000 specialty care physicians by 2020 in Michigan. And, and so we have, across the country, we, are have, we have a growing shortage of physicians. We're going to have that shortage in Michigan, and we're going to have that shortage in this region. And if we want to assure that we have the pipeline of physicians to take care of our kids, our grandkids, we need to, we need to have a medical school to help develop that pipeline that's focused on developing the pipeline yes. for southwest Michigan. Now, I know you're a pediatrician, but um, there are also going to be a lot of old folks who, yes. who need geriatric. Gerontologists down so the road. Geriatrics is a very important part of the yes. curriculum because, as you know, that we, we have an aging population. And in fact, the best estimates on the number of physicians who are needed, those estimates are actually short because the, amount, the number of physicians you need as you get older, uh, the amount of medical care you need goes up. And so, uh, if anything, we're on the, on the short side of having uh, even the projected number of physicians. Yes, yes, it's urgent. I, and I don't want to throw you off track or not, but I see a greater role than ever for nurse assistants yes. um, sharing the load. I, I think across the board, we're going to see the model of care change. We're going to see greater use and need for physician's assistants, for nurse practitioners. And so I, I think all of us in healthcare, we have to change our thinking about how healthcare is delivered because there are not going to be enough physicians. And so that's changing already. It, that change will accelerate. Yes. And again, um, back to the very beginning where you said ethics. I'm getting maudlin. Instead of getting enthusiastic, I'm being maudlin. End of life mm -hmm. decisions. I heard someone just a few weeks ago saying, getting to the point now where we should have a physician who will say to the family, Grandad, maybe it's time we took him off dialysis and put him on to comfort care. Um, because we have the technology to keep people alive, mm -hmm. perhaps indefinitely, uh, it doesn't mean that we have to uh, spend a huge amount of medical expense in the last three months of somebody's life. There are different estimates out there, but uh, many estimates say about half of your total lifetime expenditure of health care will be in your, your last six or so months of life. Half. So it's, it is a huge economic burden. As a profession, we haven't done a good job of addressing these issues. As a society, we've done an even worse job. Yes. I'm not sure as a profession or as a society we're ready to address those questions. But healthcare, care, um, we have a lot of resources in, in medicine and a lot of resources in, in this country. So I don't want to be too pessimistic. I think we actually have a lot of resources. We need to better use those resources to provide health care for all of us. And I, th I think those opportunities are there. But we still have some work to do to, to be able to, to do that across the board for everybody. Yes. I, I, I still, 
I've seen families torn apart. Half the family saying, you know, we should let mother, grandmother mm -hmm. fade away. Um, somebody in a coma for years, and it's time to unplug. And the other half of the family saying, no, no. And, and this is a very and, sensitive issue. It, it cuts to the core of yes. our values as, as individuals, our values as a society. And it's, it is very difficult, but we need to at least have the discussion and, and bring those ideas uh, forward that can help us all reach a place where, where we can go forward as a society. Right now, it's very fragmented. So we, again, we keep going back to your curriculum, your themes, this idea of physicians who can't just study you as a bunch of organs, but who can see you as a whole person and part of a family, and the ability to communicate in words of, that can be understood by the other side. There's one other aspect, and that is the need for physicians in a community to educate patients mm -hmm. and the general community. That's why I hope that Monday Night Live from time to time will have people like yourself on and we can somehow get across some of these ideas to the people who are on the receiving end of medical care. Uh, we, in medicine, we call it health literacy, to make sure that our patients understand what we say. And as you, can, as you know, there's a lot of pressure on physicians, and the average physician visit may only be about seven minutes. Mm -hmm. That's really hard to develop a relationship and actually convey everything that you need to do uh, within a, se a seven-minute period. There's a lot of... I think education that we can do with our patients, and we have to figure out better ways to to increase the knowledge and understanding of our patients. We, we have a lot of work in front of us. We can't leave it all to the adverts on television. No. Um, they will take the complex medical term and turn it down to ADH or something. You know, if you've got ADH, because they they don't want the big word, and and they they read the small print. Uh, this could kill you, you might have a stroke, da, 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 but as you, the words are being jabbered out, the picture on the screen shows people smiling, walking through the woods. Yeah. We don't hear the side effects. You can't leave medical education to the people who are selling medicine. So you, you reference this by ethics, and there are a lot of people, there are a lot of individuals who question the ethics of direct-to-consumer marketing. Is it really appropriate to be marketing that way? It's not a clear-cut answer. No doesn't place, take place in Britain. No. Can't, they can't do that thing. And if you did go to your doctor and say, I want this, the doctor there would say, yes, but I'm in charge of the case. And it's a very different situation. Anything you really want to get across, or should we summarize a bit? I, I think what struck me here is all the thought that's gone into it, all the support you've got already, that we're using what we've already got in Kalamazoo. Two good hospitals, KCMS, talked to KCMS some time ago. All kinds of things going on there. Um, we've got those things going. There's a need for it. There's a demand. We need more doctors and medical students or would-be medical students are being turned down now. It's going to cost money. You have to raise more money mm -hmm. and you will have to charge fees for a private medical school. Our tuition will be at the rate of most private, about the average of most private medical schools, which is about 40 in the high 40s a year for tuition. But you are confident? Well, you know, we, I think we have a, a great uh, situation here in Kalamazoo. We've got an, a top national research university. We've got two great hospitals. And I think we have a, a fourth uh, parent of the university, that's the community. This, this, uh, this medical school wouldn't happen without the support of the community. Specifically, the $100 million foundation gift, that is a transformational gift that this medical school would not happen without that kind of support from the community. And as you said, we know that we need more. $100 million is, uh, it's a lot of money. And there's, a, but there's a lot of need to be able to get to where we need to with the, with the accrediting agencies. And so that's really the work over the next two or three years. But it's going to happen.